Good morning. I'm Jim Levinson, Dean of the Yale Jackson School of Global Affairs. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody and, of course, a special welcome to the President. President Arce's lecture is our annual Sunrise Foundation lecture. Funded by the Sunrise Foundation, the lecture features prominent speakers who come to speak on themes related to political and or economic issues in emerging markets. And the Sunrise Foundation also provides fellowships to deserving graduate students here at Yale from emerging markets enrolled at the Jackson School. The title of President Arce's talk is Emerging Economies in Latin America, the Bolivian Economic Model. President Arce has been president since November of 2020. He has served in the Bolivian public service for the entirety of his career, beginning with the Central Bank of Bolivia. He has served as Minister of Economic Affairs and Public Finance under Evo Morales for almost 14 years. As minister, he successfully managed the Bolivian economy in a period of unprecedented growth and poverty reduction. From 2006 to 2011, GDP grew by an average of 4.6% per year, peaking at 6.8% in 2013. And quite impressively, at the same time, unemployment decreased, inflation fell, and poverty was dramatically reduced. A pretty incredible record. He was elected president in October of 2020 with a majority of the votes. I will note with special pride, and I speak here for both Professor Caliendo and myself, uh, President Arce has also taught economics and finance at various universities. Today's talk will be moderated by Professor Lorenzo Caliendo. Lorenzo is the Juan Park Han Professor of Global Affairs and also holds professorship at the School of Management. Lorenzo serves as Jackson's Deputy Dean and is himself from Uruguay. So Lorenzo will start us off with some uh, talk, some questions, and, and then we'll open it up. I also want to extend a welcome to those who are joining us as this is being live streamed uh, to many, many around the world. Uh, President Arce, thank you so very, very much for joining us here at Yale. Lorenzo. That's, uh, after acting that introduction, I think it's, uh, President, why don't you actually give your, your talk? You were thinking about actually talking in the, in the podium or you wanna do it sitting oh, from yes. here? I think there's a... Uh, That's great, so why don't you first, uh, why don't you start, please? Thank you. Good morning to everybody. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, Professor James Tobin University, I will always have followed all the writings that he has done and the, all the research that he has. So for me, it's a pleasure to be here in this university. Um, I would like to start just because I think the time is the, the worst that we have in the world. So. Um, I would like to talk very briefly about what is the, our model is, the principles, the basics, and also it is very important for us the results in the both fields, economic and social results, which is very important because uh, at the moment we create this model in 2005 with Professor Carlos Villegas who was working with me at the university at the time, um, we have to fail, we have to fail with uh, the neoliberalist model who, watch, who was in place in Bolivia for 20 years. Since 1985 to 2005, 20 years of neoliberalism in Bolivia, and there were no model, no, there, is, there were no alternative models to face or to replace the neoliberalism model. So when we started to do that, it, it took uh, many years to develop this. 
we have to face many, um, many problems and you will see a, a graph which we will compare, you know, what we, the, the, the uh, neoliberalist model against the, our model where the most important differences and results of each one. So I will start very briefly talking about the basics of the, our model, which we call economic, social, community, productive model. And we have to put it those words because it's a very long name for a model, but uh, it is important to say that at a time we have to emphasize that the economic uh, policy should be and is always a social issue. Uh, economics is mainly a social science because we have to solve the problems of people. And uh, the neoliberalist model, the market models, don't take into account many times the social issues. So we, that's why we call it economic, social, communitarian, productive model. And also, communitarian because we recover from the indigenous people, the principles as solidarity and other principles and values that the indigenous peoples have and, you know, survive to the neoliberalism in, in my country. Uh, and productive because we are changing the Bolivian the people's mind because we would like to become a productive country rather than only trade or you know, only services. We, we would like to have a productive country, which is another uh, way to do it. So that is the, the basics of the, what we put that long name. And the basics is that uh, a country should grow based on the natural resources a country has. getting ex economic excellence from them, and which is very important because it is, we, are, we are the antithesis of the natural resource course theory, you remember in your, at the, your lectures. And we demonstrate to everybody that uh, a country who has natural resources can develop based on the natural resources, which is very important for us. That's why at the beginning of our uh, government with President uh, Evo Morales, we, we put in place the nationalization of hydrocarbons and other, and other uh, resources that now, under the new constitutions, is under control of the state. That's the main issue there. Secondly, we generate economic surpluses, excellence we call it, in order that the state appropriates of the, uh, this excellent, this surplus. And why the state has to be here, and that's the big issue at that time, I think still in many countries the debate that if market economy or the state in the economy, we sorted this problem in 2006 because we were uh, appointed that the state has to be in the economy. It's a, a very important role of the economy. It has to be related to the, the, to the state uh, and not to the market, because the market, it's not uh, a equilibrium in the market. When normally, there is no equilibrium in the market. And normally, in the market are two players, offers and demanders, but one of them is always winning. It's not a, uh, an equilibrium in that uh, market. So for us, it's very important that the state has to be, you know, it has to appropriate it to get the, uh, the surplus of the economy in order to, to do the third basic of the model, which is redistribute. The principal role of the state has to be to redistribute it because we are facing now, and there are many books, Mr. Piketty is, is doing a good job there, 
trying to understand the inequality in the world. But who's going to resolve the inequality? The market? No. From our point of view, the market never will solve the problem. Who is going to be the, 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 the solver of the problem is, of course, the state. So generate surpluses, excedents, the state appropriates it and redistribute it. Why we would like to redistribute income uh, surpluses in the economy? Uh, because we have to resolve the inequality and the poverty that we are facing in 2005. So that's the principle. It's very easy. When, when you look at the models, and Professor Tobin shows us uh, in a very good manner in many researches, that the models have to be very simple in order to succeed. And the principles of our model, as you can see, it's very easy. To generate excedents from the natural resources in my country, redistribute it among people by the states to resolve the problem of poverty and inequalities. That's it. That's the model in a, in a very easy way and very uh, short way. That's the way our model works. On the left-hand side, we have the national resources. We have hydrocarbons, mining, electricity, all the strategic sectors. We get the, the money from those sectors in order to redistribute them. The state is in the middle of it, receives the money on the surpluses, and uh, do the redistribution process, not only generating a new country, industrialized country with industry, manufacturing and so on, generate income, employment and so on. But also, as you, you can see it in the bottom of the, of the graph, you see the income redistribution and poverty reduction process which comes from the income, the, the, the resources that we can generate in the surpluses from the national <coughs> resources. That's it. It's very very simple, the principles that our model uh, has. And in, in, this, in this one, you have the, some of the differences with the neoliberalist model, uh, which was in place in Bolivia since 1985, as you can see it, up to 2005. And in the right-hand side of the graph, you see the economic, social, community, productive model, which was two, two phases of it. One, from 2006 up to November 2019, 2019, which we, we suffered a coup d'etat in Bolivia. The neoliberalist model came again, no, wrongly from my point of view. And then when we restart our model in November 2020, when I became the president of my country. We restarted, and uh, of course we have uh, good results, you will see uh, later on. But those are the principal differences, you know. The first one is the most debated one, which is the free market against the active presence and participation of the state in the economy. That's the debate, you know. And it's a long, a long story. In economics, in, in economics you know, it's it's a long story about, about that. But in our case, in a less developing country where we have a, um, many indigenous people, poverty, inequality, non-industrialized -industrial, industrialized country, and so on, for us is a solution that the state can resolve this problem. And that's what we have done so far. Um, one of the inter interesting things is that the, uh, the neoliberalist model, and now every, every, every time we are looking at even, even uh, every, every year is less dependent, but um, at the beginning, what the neoliberalist model used to say is that uh, uh, in order to grow, a country should export. You know? We have a president in Bolivia who used to say, export or die. That was the, uh, 
the beginning of the neoliberalism in my country. And uh, in my country, we just die trying to export. Uh, so what we have done is to change the engine of the model. Instead to be the external demand, should be the internal demand. We should base the growth uh, on people. Because people need to uh, get better life every day, become better days for everybody. And that is consumption, that's investment in a country, not working for other countries. So that's, uh, those are principles I would say more important in order to uh, resume the main uh, ideas of the model. Now, we turn in some results that many of them, of course, are in the IMF, World Bank report, and uh, many international institutions. The first one is the growth rate. You can see in the, in the average growth rate from uh, 1985, 2005, it means the neoliberalist model. The growth rate was 3% on average. And in, in, in our government, in the first government, 2006 and 2019, 2019, 4.7%, we increase very clearly the uh, uh, growth rate. And of course, here, uh, 2019, it, uh, you know, you know, and 2020 about the uh, COVID-19 and so on, the, the, the pandemic and so on, affected, of course, all the countries. And it is we have a decrease in for 8.7% great road. So, you know, we, we were one of the countries in South America that have, you know, the worst economic performance at the time. When the neoliberalist model became again in the, uh, the government uh, who gave the um, coup d'etat in Bolivia, you know. Now we are increasing at 4% is the growth rate estimated for this year. And uh, I think we can do that better. We will see it, what we are doing. Another thing is that uh, many times, for six times, we, we, we haven't put it in the, in the screen now, but Bolivia was, in six times, the first growth economic rate in the region. Uh, you, some of them, you, you, you wait to 20, 2014, 2018, 2018. But of course, if you look at, at 2020, when uh, neoliberalism came again to Bolivia, we were uh, almost the last one in growth rate, but uh, a, with a negative one, you know. So it means that uh, our model used to have better results than when we, are, we were in the neoliberalism again. And this is very important. We divided the growth rate in Bolivia uh, for the source of the, this growth rate. If you look at, at the um, blue, uh, blue bar, it is the internal demand, which it, this, graph, this graph shows you that the internal demand is very important to give us the growth rates which it means, internal demand means consumption, means investments in my country, who are the, which are the, which are the, uh, the main issues that, they, that are driving the growth in my country, which is, you know, very, very, um, very clear with our model, the, the theoretical issue of the model. The internal demand is uh, driving the, the the growth rate, not the external demand, which is the exports uh, minus imports, which is the external demand, which is also negative for us and many, many uh, times. And in those years where uh, we benefit from the ex exports, of course, it works together. The uh, external demand plus the internal demand succeed in increasing the, the Bolivian economy. This, uh, another one, shows a very important thing for us because at that time, um, everybody 
look at uh, our government as a socialist one, and uh, everybody, you know, is scared about the socialism, and they say, uh, socialists will take off from you all your goods and so on, and there will no be no a, um, a private uh, enterprises because the socialists, what they want is to keep everything for the state and no private enterprises at all. That's what they used to say. And this graph shows you that in our government, in, under our model, the private sector increased much more than they even did in the neoliberalist model, which of course uh, shows you very clearly that is absolutely, absolutely compatible with the uh, uh, private sector because it's very easy to understand that. When the public sector invests, you know, it is like, uh, like a train that every, every all, all, the, all the cars afterwards are pulled by the state. You know, everybody, uh, when the state invests, you know, there is a multiplier impact in other sectors, private sectors, and that's why you have the impact. You, if you look at, at to 2005, only seven, seven, four thousand public, uh, private enterprises were, uh, were in Bolivia. And now we have more than 355,000 private enterprises working in my country. So it is very clear that uh, we have an impact also in the private sector with our model. Um, the, G the per capita GDP, which is very important, you know, we started in 2005 with only 1,000 US dollars per capita income. Now we are 3,047 US dollars so we multiply by three the uh, uh, per capita GDP in our country, which is very important, as you know. Uh, the inflation is not a problem in my country. Even now, accumulated inflation rate from January to August is only 1.6% of inflation rate. Even in these years, you know, when we all know that the inflation is a worry for everybody, especially here in the United States, in Europe, you're very worried about what's going on with the food prices, with the energy prices, and so on. And that's not a worry in our country because we have the lowest inflation in our region and maybe uh, would be in the, the lowest, one of the countries which has uh, had the lower inflation in, in the world, I would say. So it is very important because we are taking care about poor people. Our model uh, takes care of poor people. We look for them. I mean, we try to do everything for protecting all the uh, poor people who live in my country. That's why uh, inflation is the worst thing for poor people. Because rich people, they know how to protect them. But poor people, they don't have instruments in order to protect from the inflation rate. So that's why uh, we take care of the inflation. Uh, the trade balance has improved in, the, in this year. From 2021 to 2022, we have positive numbers. In the past, we were looking at negative numbers in the trade balance. Uh, but now we are improving because we have a policy which substitutes imports. Import substitution, we call it. The import substitution process uh, we put in place in November 2020 and uh, it's giving us good results. We are improving exports, but also we are reducing imports, uh, showing that Bolivia has an, uh, a big and enormous, I would say, uh, uh, production potential that we are using now in order to reach these figures, as you can see in the graph. Savings and number of deposits is very important. Look at, at uh, the flat uh, savings in the financial system in the neoliberalist model. From uh, you have you you have in the graph here in the left hand side left hand side graph. In 1997 uh, up to 20, 2025 2005 uh, in the neoliberalist model almost flat the uh, the savings of people, 
and the saving started to increase with our economic model. And we have from 5,000 million billion US dollar, we have now 31,000 billion. So we have a lot of increase in the saving. People have more money, that's what they say. And also, in the right hand side graph, you see the increase of the uh, loans. Uh, and the, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, number, of, uh, number of accounts, it's very important, this, this number. We started in 2005 with 1.9 thousand uh, of accounts in my country. And now we have more than 14,000 uh, of accounts. It means that more people now have more uh, deposits at the banks, which is very important in developing countries because it means that not only they have money now, but the income they have, you know, is more than the spend expenditures they have, so they are, have a margin of saving. And those savings now are increasing in the deposits and in the number of accounts as well, which is very important. And when we divide it, when we divide it, we would, we would like to see if the money that is the number of accounts and the money that is getting in the bank belongs to rich people or poor people. We look at, we divide it, the, in the right hand side graphic, the people has, that has less than $500 deposit, deposited in the, in the banks, you know, and so on, at more than 5,000 US dollars deposited in the, at the banks. And you will see that 87% actually in, the, in Bolivia of the accounts belong to people who have only uh, 500 US dollars or less deposited in the bank, at the banks. So it means that, you know, we have democratized also the economy, the money. Now they have accounts and more people that have accounts now in the, in, at the banks is, uh, are people that, you know, uh, have less resources, less income. That is very important because it shows us yeah, some of the results of the redistribution model that we put in place. The loans, the financial system loans also increase, as you can see. And the non-performing loans are very, very low, uh, comparing with what, had, what happened in the neoliberalist period. You know? So if you look at 1997, 28, even we have 16% of non-performing loans. But now we have only 2% of non-performing loans, even in, in a period where we face the pandemic and everybody used the, 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 the savings at the banks in my country and also they, they didn't have money and so they didn't pay the debts, the, the loans at the banks because they didn't have money at that time. So even though, even though we have only 2.2% of you know, non-performing loans in, uh, in my country. Also, this is very important, the Bolivianization process. Uh, at the, uh, in the neoliberalist model, um, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, who was the advisor in the, uh, of that government at the beginning of the neoliberalism in Bolivia, put in place a dollarization process in order to face, you know, to face the, um, the hyperinflation we suffer in 1992, to 1984, more, where we look at an inflation rate of 20, 21,000%, 21,000% of inflation, of annual inflation rate. So when we uh, became government in 2006, we started to do many policies in order to de-dollarize the economy. And we succeed, as you can see in the graph. In the past, in the neoliberalist model, only 5% of in the financial system were deposits in, in, in our domestic can, uh, currency, which is El Boliviano. Uh, but now we have 85% of people is depositing 
money in domestic currency. And also in the loans, in the neoliberalist model, 7% of the loans were made in uh, domestic currency, and now 99% of the loans are made in our currency, demonstrating the confidence of people in our currency and our policy and in all the results we were uh, getting from uh, our model. And now we don't have problems with the dollarization in the economy. We are doing very well and uh, people you know, uh, trust in our domestic currency, which is for monetary policy, you know, very important. If people don't trust in your currency, you cannot do any monetary policy at all. So it is very useful for us to recover the monetary policy from the dollarization process that the neoliberalism did in the past. Of course, Professor Sachs now is not uh, a, a neoliberalist professor, you know, has, has changed his mind, fortunately, I would say. But uh, at the time, he advised this kind of dollarization process. The global and current fiscal balance uh, get better if you look at uh, in the neoliberalist process, all negative. We have um, more or less um, nine years of surpluses, and, and then we started to have, again, a, a fiscal deficit. We were uh, recovering from that, and then, again, uh, the coup d'etat came in my country and started to do bad, uh, wrongly uh, economic policies. We again, we have almost 13% of the GDP as uh, f uh, fiscal deficit. It's an enormous one, you know. And we started to reduce it. Now we are looking to have uh, 8 and 7% and so on. All these years we were going to recover those uh, figures in this fiscal balance, but you know, you, you can see it easily what happened in the fiscal sector. It is very important here. Since we have put in place the um, neoliberal, the, the uh, economic, social, community, and productive model in my country, which is our model, uh, we change the source of funding of our uh, public investment. In the past, the public investment came from mainly external resources, debt, external debt, basically. Now, the uh, two-thirds of the investment, the public investment in my country, come from the internal resources, you know? And you can, and you can uh, ask yourself, what's going on? No, why we change the... the the, the, the source of the funding of the investment, the public investment in my country. And the reason is that when you recover your national resources, you have money. You have money. That money can, that in the past were going out away. You know, we uh, keep the money in my country and started to invest the money that came from the national resources. That's why very, uh, in a huge change in the percentage of funding, or the source of the funding the, of the uh, public investment. Public investment, by the way, is one of the key issues in our model, which is very converse what we, uh, it comes from the neoliberalist model, where the base of the neoliberalist model is, of course, the private investment. In our model, the state is the main actor there, so the public investment is the main issue for us. That's why it changes. We invest more as a public sector and we have results, as you see, uh, and that's why, because we recover all the natural resources uh, and so on, we recover the, fund, the source of funding our investments. The medium and long-term public debt is not a problem in my country since our model. But in the past, as you can see, you have the, the rate, the ratio, uh, external debt uh, again GDP. Uh, you can see that uh, in the past, um, there were many years that this ratio were more than 50%. But since our government, since our model, 
we change it, we reduce it, because we increase the denominator of the equation uh, and reduce, you know, uh, the ratio, and now we have only 28% of the ratio uh, between uh, um, external debt against GDP. So we m were more comfortable now with the, the figures, macroeconomic figures, as you can see. We increase the national minimum wage. In Bolivia, we have a minimum wage for everybody. Nobody has to earn a salary, a wage, uh, less than that. Yeah, and here, I think we have in US dollars, yes. Uh, if you look at 2005, 54 US dollars, it was the minimum salary in my country. And now we have more than 30, 20, 323 US dollars. We, so in, though in, in this time, we have increased a lot the minimum wages in my country, so people is getting more money. And uh, if you look at the, 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 the figure, the comparing the figure between our country, Bolivia, in 2005, we should have, we, we used to have the lowest minimum wage in all South America. And now we are just in the middle. And uh, you know, if, you, if we continue with this model, I think we, we were uh, getting better uh, year by year. The unemployment rate is also is a succeed for us. We used to have 8%, almost 9% of uh, unemployment. Uh, in our government, we, in, in the, applying our model, we had more or less 4%, 4.4%, 4.2%. And, uh, you know, now we have 5.2%, but, but in, 20, in 2020, we have 12% of, uh, of unemployment rate, you know, <laughs> under the pandemic. It was very, very uh, worried about that. But uh, in any case, Unemployment is also a variable that shows you that we have improved a lot. And still, uh, there are some to do in this uh, variable, but I think uh, we succeed also in reducing unemployment. Also, when we look at the social results, we have here how we reduce extreme poverty and how we compare it with all the South American countries did in the same period. In the left-hand side uh, graph, you will see that we received the country with 38% of ex uh, extreme poverty in my country, and we reduced it up to 11% last year. Even last year, we reduced it much more than we did in the past. So it means that the model is working again. It's working again. And when we compare our results with uh, all the other countries in South America, that of course all the countries are trying to reduce the poverty as well. If you compare it, Bolivia reduce uh, more than everybody in, in, in our region. We reduce in 20%, 27%. Uh, Peru, for example, reduced it in almost 12% in the same period between 2005 and 2021. So it means that our model not only succeeds in uh, getting uh, good macroeconomic results, but also has good social results, which is an advantage of our model that the neoliberalist model cannot appropriate, cannot talk about, because they never reach both. Also, the income inequality by Gini index, we reduce it. We were a very inequality country together with Brazil. We were the, the, the worst in the, in the region in 2005. Uh, we have 0.60 of Gini index. And now we are only 0 0.42, which is a, a huge reduction. And again, when we compare our results from those that, that the countries in, the, in South America get, you know, it's very, I, again, Bolivia reduced it in point 0.15, and all the other countries reduced it less 
than we have done with our model. Taking into account that many countries still, still they are using the neoliberalist model. This is another very important thing, the structure of the social stratum, the uh, composition of people according to the, to the income. In 2005, 60% of people in Bolivia were in low income conditions, 35% in middle income conditions, and only 4% in high income conditions. Now, when you compare, we have 36% in low income in, in conditions. We reduce it from 60 to 36. And we have increased the middle income people from 35% to 60%. Almost we double the figure from 2005. So we have reduced poverty. We have increased the income, especially middle income. And this is not only our figures. I will show you some World Bank figures later. Also, we reduced the differences between the, the richest 10% people in my country against the 10% richest, uh, were, uh, uh, poorest uh, people in my country. When you compare the richest 10% against the, uh, the, the poorest 10%, we have a difference of 128 times in the past. But now we have only 20 times. Still, some job to do. Yeah, we are completely agree. But we have reduced a lot, especially in the rural area. People who live in the rural area, they reduce more the inequality among rich people, the poor and poor people. And as I promised, here is the World Bank. This is a, a picture of the World Bank. They, they uh, issue a report where it says the income growth, the, the poorest 40% of the population who do the best in order to reduce the, or some uh, improves for the income of the poorest 40% of a country. And you see here, uh, Bolivia, it's a, we have market at the top, is the country that increase the income of the poorest 40% better than, the other, than any other country in the world. Huh? In the world. It is a World Bank picture. It's not our picture, it's the World Bank picture. We, according to the World, the, the world Bank, we in, increase the income uh, growth of the poorest 40% in 12.5%. You know, um, Peru did, let's say, nine, nine percent, nine and, a, and something percent, and so on. So Bolivia, according to the World Bank, is doing better in improving the income growth of the 40 percent of uh, poorest people in my country, uh, comparing with all over the countries in the world. So, so those are results. And the last picture I have for you is this one that is very important uh, for us which is the expectance, the life expectancy at birth. Bolivia, if you look at the, uh, let's say, the blue bars, uh, we have a 64 years old of life expectancy in uh, 2005. Now we have increased it to 74 years. And uh, you have all the countries there in South America, but in the picture that is, that is in the bottom, you will see, uh, comparing all the increases in life expectancy in the region, Bolivia has increased almost 11 years of life expectancy, which is the highest increase in the life expectancy in the region. For example, Brazil increased in five years old, in the same period. But Bolivia did in almost 11 years. So that's why, I will finish it with this uh, figure, um, we say that uh, our model 
uh, and has succeeded not only in the economic side, but also, more important for us, in the social side, because if we have a more equal country, we have a better um, country, a better fitted country, better healthy country, we will have more and better results and a better society. That's why, that's the objective when I say at the beginning of the model. Reduce the poverty, which we did, we have done, and reduce the inequalities that also we have done, we have reached with this model. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I think it was a very enlightening uh, conversation and, and hypothesis about the Bolivian, basically, uh, I would say, new paradigm in terms of thinking about growth. In, uh, mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a set of questions that I'm gonna, actually going to start asking the President, but I do want this to be a conversation. So in the sense, uh, if people have questions, please raise your hand, and uh, I'm going to give you the chance to basically ask a question. But uh, let me start, basically, first. In, uh, so it's fascinating, and uh, clearly this is, the data speaks from by itself, right? Thinking about when, when the new, let's say, economic model that, basic, that you have proposed, uh, because you were the Minister of Finance during this period, right? So uh, with Evo Morales. In, in the macro, if you see the macro numbers are quite uh, impressive. Lower inequality, lower unemployment, lower inflation, and at the same time, more resources collected from the government. These resources coming from, as you were saying, the resource-based aspect of the economy. Mm -hmm. So I guess I have questions about uh, thinking about the long run, thinking about the long run. So how do, we, how do you think about, so first, lessons. What are the micro lessons? I'm going to be asking that in a second. But more thinking about the long run. So how do we, a country that, uh, like Bolivia, that really depends on the prices of commodities. So clearly you were saying about the importance of the internal market, but these resources are global. When you're thinking about lithium, when you're thinking about other commodities in the world, they're driven by global supply and demand. So how do we make this more sustainable in the long run? So I'll give you an example. Chile, which has been an exporter of copper for many years, they have basically adapted a fiscal rule. A fiscal rule to basically guarantee somehow like a level of spending that it's not fluctuating with the commodity prices. Uh, another example is Uruguay. Uh, no surprise, I'm from Uruguay. They're also just adapted a fiscal rule. We don't have a resource-based economy as the case of Bolivia. And there's other resources that Uruguay basically produces, but we do get fluctuations in commodity prices and that can explain a big component of these macro imbalances. So I guess Moving forward, in a, and I apologize for the question, it's more no, a challenging question, which is... Very good question, I would say. Sorry? I, I would say it's a very good question. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, sorry. So what do you think? Uh, so let's... How do, you, how do we generate something that's sustainable more in the long run, let's yeah. say? Rules not always work uh, in the, you know... And uh, what happened with rules and that those kind of, uh, you know... Uh, ways to manage the economy usually break down very quickly mm -hmm. because they are not prepared for faced uh, crisis like this one, for yeah, example, yeah. and they broke the, the rules. And those bro those rules, for example, uh, European Union, it was 3% of the uh, fiscal deficit. Mm -hmm. I don't know this year <laughs> how they will how they will work. I mean, <laughs> but anyway, um, the better rule is the rule that is flexible, mm -hmm. in my point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, 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 in order to answer your question, which is a very good question, the long run, mm -hmm. you know, in the long run, uh, we have to industrialize our national resources. Mm -hmm. We have to increase the production of food, mm -hmm. the agriculture sectors, we have to improve it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in order to have no uh, import dependence at all. And that's what we are working on. If you look at what happened in, in, the, in this crisis, for example, fertilizing, mm -hmm. agrochemics, you know, you know and mm -hmm. so on, uh, went up and everybody cried. And food rise prices 
and there were not food all over the world. Everybody were looking where to buy food. Mm -hmm. What we have to do is improve the agriculture sectors to improve productivity, to, to, to become a, you know, less dependent, at least if not totally independent from the imports of uh, uh, inputs, seeds, and so on. Because everybody is looking uh, for seeds for everybody. And that's the problem. That is the problem in my country. Mm -hmm. We are started to face this problem, I mean, to, to, to do some policies in order to avoid this problem in 2020, mm -hmm. when I became president of my country. We started uh, to issue policies, we started the uh, import substitution process, policies we put in place, and so on. That is the difference we have these results rather than all, all people that was, you know, trusting on the globalization, trusting on imports and free market and those things that uh, never worked. Mm -hmm. Because when there is crisis, nobody is your friend. Mm -hmm. Everybody is looking themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's why we are facing this problem. So, agriculture. Um, if you don't have uh, 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 last model cars, it doesn't care, but if does care if you don't have food. So that's the first thing that the, the world has to do it, you know? Uh, in our case, the countries which have a natural resource, they have to industrialize it as soon as possible. And of course, in our point of view, according to the uh, respecting the mother earth, uh, you know, ecologic development, which is very important which is very important. It's most costly, but we have to do it. Rich countries didn't do it at the moment, and at that moment. Uh, we have to do it. So in our countries, it's much costly to become a developed country, but mm -hmm. we have to do it. We have to develop all the natural resources, respecting, I say again, with uh, Mother Earth. Uh, then, you have to invest in education, you have to invest in health, you have to invest in many things, yes. and that is the long run. Yes. That is the long you, If you have food, yes. and you have education, you have investment technology, you have a long-term uh, growth rate. This is great, this is great. He's talking about uh, sources of growth, and uh, this goes back to the textbook, uh, economics model, so human capital <laughs> seems to be important. Uh, of course, investment, private and public investment. And I guess what we're learning from, from Bolivia is more like, so we know the ingredients, the recipe, it's a very local recipe, the Bolivian way of, of doing this. Uh, anyone has a, a particular question we'd like to ask? Yes, please, why don't you, yes. Thanks, uh, Mr. President. My name is David Alzate, I am from Quito, Ecuador. I'm a master's student here at the Jackson School. Um, thank you again for being here, congratulations on economic policies, the stability and growth that your country has experienced, especially in this post-pandemic recovery period, and especially for your focus and commitment of improving the lives of those that are most in need of the poorest households in the country. Um, my question relates to an apparent contrast, perhaps, between your foreign policy and your domestic economic model. So domestically, as you've explained today, you were to prioritize improving the living conditions of those most in need. However, in your foreign policy, you do recognize and support the regime of Nicolás Maduro in Venezuela. Is this not, to you, an apparent contradiction to support a regime that has been responsible for the largest amount of human suffering in our contemporary history in the region, a country that now 76% of Venezuelans live in extreme poverty under less than $1.90 a day? So how can you claim to support, in general, improving the lives of the poor while also Supporting uh, the regime of Venezuela. Thank you. Thank you. Well, actually, we don't support any government except us. All right? Uh, what we ha do have is good relations with everybody, even with the United States. Even with the United States. We don't, uh, you know, we don't have bad, re bad relations with the European Union. European Union and many countries, you know participate actively in the coup d'etat in 2019. 
but we still have relations. Uh, Bolivia is a country who always will maintain good relations with all the countries. That is our foreign policy. Uh, we have uh, good relations with Chile, for example. We have a huge problem there about the sea, right? But Bolivia is always not supporting. We don't support any government. We have good relations with the governments. So it's a difference. We respect the autodetermination of the nations. If they want to do what they, do, what they want to do in their country, it's their problem, not our problem. We have to respect the way they decided to live, decided to, to, to do elections or not elections, or whatever regime, political regime they decided to adopt, you know? the economic policy they decide to do. We live in a country where there are many countries that are applying, still they are applying, and the university are they still uh, teaching the neoliberalist model. And we respect it. I mean, it's a way. Uh, it doesn't mean that we support them, you know? I think we have to live in a world where we have to respect each other. That's the best way, I would say, to live in peace and uh, with everybody. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, let, me, let me ask a question, going back mm. to, to your, your presentation, and we can ask someone else basically wants to ask a question. So I guess uh, something that was quite surprising to me was uh, uh, in the model that, uh, that has been working, let's say, in Bolivia, this idea of tenant resources from what used to be from the private sector now belongs to the government the idea of the resources. How do we get this resource basis on natural resources? So the question is, but at the same time, you were, you were showing a lot of firm entry, data that actually firms have been actually going up over time. So I guess uh, one would actually, as an economist, basically maybe would say, a priori, one would expect something on the contrary. If it is the case that the government is collecting rents from firms, that would disincentivize mm -hmm. firm entry and firms uh, investing in the country. So, how did this happen? So can you, so I'm thinking about learning. Is it in different sectors? How come we are still generating incentives for firms to invest and enter in Bolivia, when at the same time you're telling us that some of these resources actually are now collected to go to the, to the government and the people? Okay. Well, we, uh, looking for lessons. we differentiate, we differentiate. If there is an international enterprise that have to, that like to come to Bolivia to work, and uh, own the natural resources. Like the land. Uh, for example, uh, or mining or, or hydrocarbons. Mine. The constitution says mm -hmm. that at least 51% has to belong to the state. Mm -hmm. So we can make some business, but in national resources, more than 51% has to, has to be for the state. You know. That's one of the restrictions. In other sectors, tourism, uh, exactly. services, industry, whatever, uh, you don't have any limitation. You, you can go and have to have to be 100%, whatever, no problem at all. But for the national resources, we have a, a restriction very clearly uh, in the Constitution. Very, very, very interesting. Uh, anyone else has, uh, would like to? Yes, please. I have a question, and if I may, I will say both in Spanish and English. Ah, yes, I mean, I, I was doing it in English, but uh, pero podía haber también en español, por supuesto. Sí, sí, sí. Hay audiencia. Bilingüe, por supuesto. Hispano parlante. Hispano parlante. My question, I really appreciate the work that you're mentioning, and I agree with you, because I think that the problem that we have in Bolivia is that we have a very good relationship with the government, with the private sector, and with the resources. What has been the main, the main challenge to respect Mother Earth? I le pregunto al, al Presidente Arce, eh, primero eh, comentando que, que bien me parece que la madre, el, el concepto de Madre Tierra para los recursos naturales, ¿cuál ha sido el reto más importante de su gobierno para respetar a la Madre Tierra? Answer in Spanish or in English? <laughs> let's, let's, start, let's start in English and then we can, we can maybe switch to Spanish. It's a, it's a Spanish or English? Oh, you choose. <laughs> uh, and, uh, well, I think some people would like to hear in English also, but. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, well, 
Of course, for every developing country, the worst problem that we're facing is the cost of technology. We would like, for example, to produce clean energy. But it's clean energy that is very costly. That's why you always, uh, in, the, in the international forums, we say that uh, developed countries should sell us. We, we don't want that they uh, give us that as a gift. But uh, you know, they, they should sell us at low, very low prices the technology in order to develop our countries respecting Mother Earth, because it's very costly to, to them. For example, roads, uh, you should, uh, uh, taking into account the cost, you should build a straight road. But in the middle you have, you know, uh, a natural reserve, whatever, you have to go around it. It's most costly, you know? And who, make, who give us the money for that? Nobody, nobody. And everybody says in the world, everybody has to respect Mother Earth, everybody. But it's costly, it's costly. And it's much costly for us to develop in this kind of uh, circumstances. But uh, I think this is the, the, the main issue, the cost of the technology, the cost of developing, that uh, the developed countries should take into account in order you know, to make policies in order to respect, to avoid some um, a crisis that could be uh, in the, you know, in the ecologic side and so on. Very interesting. No, no, no. Uh, why don't I go? Yes. It's, I don't know which one the two. Um, buenos días. Sí, también. Uh, good morning, Mr. President. <laughs> 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 eh, yo tengo una pregunta escuchando su presentación. Bolivia es un país indígena. Y, cómo, y vemos este crecimiento económico increíble que ha venido desde el 2005. ¿Cómo se puede encontrar un balance entre el mercado y las necesidades de los pueblos indígenas? Que muchas veces parecieran no ir eh, en, en la misma ruta. Eh, sobre todo eh, en discusiones de mercado que ponen a pueblos indígenas como no querer el desarrollo o las ideas de desarrollo. ¿Cómo ha encontrado ustedes, cómo ha encontrado en Bolivia este balance en, en el mercado o podemos hablar también de economías? Esa es muy buena pregunta. En realidad, en nuestro país, eh, el mercado, la economía de mercado estaba matando a los pueblos indígenas. Porque los pueblos indígenas, especialmente en nuestro país, no tienen el concepto del mercado y del desarrollo en base al mercado. Ellos sobreviven. Pero llega un momento en que en la constitución política del Estado han sido empoderados, han sido visibilizados, y por eso es que en nuestra constitución tenemos, ¿no? eh, primero, cuatro fuentes de economía. La economía estatal, la economía privada, la economía cooperativa y la economía comunitaria. La economía comunitaria. En esa economía comunitaria el Estado participa activamente en su desarrollo. Lo primero que se está resolviendo es el tema de tierra territorio. Porque los, los pueblos indígenas lo que siempre han peleado es por un espacio, tierra territorio. Tierra para producir y sobrevivir, territorio para poder vivir como ellos originalmente han vivido. Entonces, el Estado está poniendo las condiciones para que esos pueblos originarios puedan vivir en su tierra y territorio. Y ahí entra la economía comunitaria para poder enlazar la economía comunitaria, como ellos la manejan, como ellos la han vivido durante toda su vida, con órganos o con mecanismos de mercado, de Estado, de cooperativas, ¿no? que pueda interactuar con todas las partes que están en la estructura económica de nuestro país. Esa es la labor del Estado. Hay un ministerio en nuestro país, que es el Ministerio de Desarrollo Productivo y Economía Plural, se llama. 
ese ministerio es el encargado de hacer esos, esas interfaces entre estas diferentes formas de economía con los pueblos indígenas. Super, super, super interesting, uh, uh, clearly very important question and, yeah. and definitely the answer. I, I guess we have time maybe for one more question. Uh, yeah. That's okay? Or one more question. One, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to give, uh, sorry, she, 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 she raised her hand before, so yes. Yeah. It's a good issue. It's a good issue. In all the South American countries, one of the huge problems is corruption, uh, especially in the public institutions. We can find a lot of cases and uh, examples. That's why we are very, very uh, demanding with our public enterprises. The difference is that the state, you know, the different institutions of the state, and the public enterprises, we have public enterprises, where those enterprises manage the natural resources, hydrocarbons, mining, and so on. So we have created a ministry which is in charge of corruption, or fighting against corruption, you know? <coughs> uh, which is in charge of all these institutions that have to report to this uh, uh, ministry, you know, in order to, uh, to, to clarify, to transparency uh, everything uh, in the process of uh, licitations, uh, sellings, buyings, and all what the public enterprises do uh, in, in their activities. So, it is very important, this issue, so far, we didn't have uh, huge problems with the public enterprise because as everybody look at the public enterprises as the source of money for growth, for everybody uh, benefit. So everybody looking at what is, is going on with the public enterprises. Uh, in, uh, we have a law that two times a year the public enterprises, all the public enterprises in Bolivia, have to go a public uh, report for what they are doing, uh, uh, show the figures of the enterprise, you know, uh, they have to, twice a year, everybody has access to all the information about the public enterprise. That's the way we are facing. And also, a more practical issue, when a enterprise or any public entity wants to buy something, you know, uh, we are introducing an electronic uh, uh, subasta, ¿cómo se dice? Auction. Auction. An electronic auction. So it, it has reduced a lot. The Ministry of Economy and Public Finance report me uh, two weeks ago that we save money more, more than 300 million uh, using this kind of electronic auctions. Uh, so it's more transparency, it's immediately because everybody, let's say uh, the state wants to buy paper, we put it in the web, we want to buy 100 uh, 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 blocks of uh, paper, whatever, and everybody puts the offers there, and uh, immediately you know who, who wants uh, this buy. Immediately, very transparent. So uh, we save a lot of money, and we did a more transparent process 
in my country. We are introducing in every, buy, in every uh, buying and uh, activities of the public sector. So we are improving the transparency, which is very useful and, uh, you know, is in line with your worry. I think that's the way we can face the, the problem, transparency. Mr. President, thank you very much for, no, my for your talk, for your time, and uh, hope to see you again at the Jackson School of Global Affairs. So thank oh, you very much brilliant. to the audience and the questions. Thank you. <laughs>